Welcome. Welcome, everyone, um, especially for those who are joining us for the first time. It's an absolute privilege and a joy to have you here with us online. So Fellowship City is a gospel-centered, disciple-making and transcultural family in the heart of Centurion. We want to see the world awakened to the wonder of God and his transcultural church. And we are part of the Fellowship Church movement. And so we strive to be gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. Um, gospel-centered means a life-centered and saturated around the truth of the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and the return of Jesus Christ, affirming him as Lord and Savior. We find salvation, meaning purpose, and everlasting life in Jesus Christ alone. Disciple making, this means um, as the gospel transform, transforms the individual life, um, we want to see a multiplying effect of that in the lives of others. And we believe that happens best in the making of disciples. We are sent to share his love um, and make disciples who make disciples. Transcultural means having a view of community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context. And by the power of the gospel, transcends it to form one new community in Christ. So what does this actually look like? Well, we have a family um, consisting of missional communities of people who commit to living life on life, life in community, and life on mission. Um, life on mission is very important to us as we want to um, remain outwardly focused to share the good news with people and invite them into the community. So as we spend our time together, we'll be going into worship with Christina. Let's see who would um, share the word with us. Then we'll do breakouts for fellowship and discussion, and that will be then facilitated by Morandina, and Bethany will then pray for us. And lastly, um, we are found to um, on the internet, so you can contact us whenever you want to. I now hand you over to Christina. Thank you so much, Chanel. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Christina, and today I'm joined by a new face. Uh, this is Silas, all the way from Brazil. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and we're super excited to be worshipping with you all the way from Italy as well. And so that's why we have bright and sunny days. Um, and so, yeah, but we're excited that we get to experience uh, worship in community um, through this Zoom space. And so uh, we are grateful for that. Um, so this week, uh, we're diving into a new sermon series. Um, and we're kicking off the sermon series with grace. And so over the past week, it took us quite a while to decide on the songs uh, because there's just so many songs that speak of God's grace. Um, and at the end of it, uh, we actually just came to the conclusion, this is amazing. And so we want to sing of that. We want to sing of God's amazing grace towards us. And we want our hearts to be permeated and filled with that. And so I'm gonna pray for us, gonna posture our hearts, and then after that, we'll get into a time of worship. So let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for your grace and your mercies that are new to us every single morning. Uh, we pray that you would fill our hearts with the wonder of the grace that we've received in Christ. And we pray, Lord God, that you would be fully present in all that we're doing, that we would be uh, focused on you, that we'd fix our eyes on you, Lord God, um, and that we wouldn't be distracted by other things, but Lord, that we would allow ourselves to experience more and more of your presence, experience more and more of your love, Lord. Uh, you are present with us. May we be present with you. Uh, we pray this, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And so you may stand or sit, and I know it's cold, so you can have your blanket around you as well, um, but above all else, uh, engage in this time of worship and fix your eyes on Jesus.
Paul begins all 13 of his letters with that greeting um, and it's so filled with uh, such deep theology that simple greeting. Um, commentators say that it reminds the people of Israel of the blessing that they will receive from number six and so um, the Lord be gracious to you, uh, may he give you peace. Um, and so it reminds us firstly of that, that beautiful benediction, that beautiful blessing that we receive from the Lord. Um, but secondly, it reminds us that we are God's chosen people, we're God's beloved, we belong to him. Uh, and so grace and peace to you. And thirdly, uh, which for me has blown me away, is the constant reminder before we do anything else, uh, that we receive God's grace through faith and nothing else. Not through our works, not through our perfection, but through grace alone. And that should fill us with incredible peace because we can be at rest, we can be at ease in Christ because we know we received his grace. And so this morning church, grace and peace to you. Would you receive his grace, not by your works, not by how your week has gone, not by the things you've done, not by the things you've achieved, but grace from our Lord, grace from God our Father, who gives and lavishes his grace on us. May that fill your heart with peace and may that be the place from which we worship this morning. So grace and peace to you. Every heart 
Jesus, you are fully in control. That Jesus, we rely on the finished work of the cross. And so, Father, it's not because of our works, it's not because of our deeds. So we come empty handed, but we come confidently because we are your children. We come confidently before the throne of grace because we are your children, because we are dearly loved. And so, Father, would you remind us of that this morning? that your grace is enough, that you've lavished it on us, and so we can come before you now in full confidence that you hear us.
Good morning, church. Our reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10 from the CSB version. It reads as follows. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Murendini, for reading God's word for us this morning. That is our teaching text. Um, that is what we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, thank you as well, Christina and Silas, for leading us in worship. Uh, made me long and remember a time when we could be all together in one room um, raising our hands and praising and worshiping God uh, together. At one point, I was like, just keep going, just keep going. Um, just So we long for a time when we are able to gather in this way. And what a privilege to be able to be led in worship by, by Christina and Silas all the way from Italy. Um, yeah, thank you for, for leading us. Um, thank you for Chanel as well for uh, starting off our service um, with a welcome this morning. Um, um, this morning we are starting off a new series um, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City and opening off this, this new series for us. Um, this series, we are casting God's vision 
and we're inspiring people to action and obedience to God's word. So that's what we're trying to do through the series. So the series will equip people to know what God wants of his people and how we can apply what God wants in our lives, wherever he has placed us. And this is part of fulfilling the Great Commission, which is to make disciples who make disciples as Chanel um, introduced it to us. Um, so think about the series in this way. Um, actually, just a side note before we think about the series in this way. I will not be showing any food this morning, contrary to many suggestions or, or contrary to Murendeni sharing that I use food as my examples. It is true. But for those that were looking forward to some suggestions for lunch, um, you're going to have to be a little bit creative this morning. Um, so think about, think about the series in this way. So BMW are a car manufacturer. So one of their prized creations is the BMW 3 Series. It is a well-known and well-liked car. Um, when they manufacture this car, they think of what they're trying to achieve. So they've got an ultimate goal of what they're trying to achieve. They build the car to communicate the same message they are trying to achieve wherever the car is. So they build it to be stylish, to be fast, and to be luxurious. Then they showcase this vision through advertising to attract and inspire people to buy their vehicle, to live this stylish, fast, and luxurious life. The drivers then live these values. But sometimes there are other characteristics that the manufacturer doesn't want associated with the brand. I think many of you would know when you see a BMW, it's as if the indicators are not being used or they're driving so close behind other cars that you cannot see their number plate. Or think about the series as your favorite pair of jeans or shoes. If it is Levi's or Guess, or the red high heels. Um, the manufacturer or the producer who produces these products, when they're building these jeans or these shoes, they're trying to convey a particular message. Wherever the jeans or the shoes are, they are showing this message. So a message of either, either confidence, of style. Um, think of slogans that you might have with jeans, which might be slogans like add style to your day or moments of style. Um, the, the message they're trying to communicate may also be to to look good, to love to look good, or for the business woman or the business man. The people who use these jeans or shoes convey the message that the manufacturer wants to convey. So similarly, there will be other characteristics that the manufacturer doesn't want to show. Maybe arrogance or maybe lack of cleanliness. So that's how we're gonna look at our series. We're gonna be looking at each episode in our series. We'll start with a Fellowship City Nurtures. Today, it nurtures grace. So we will unpack this morning what grace is. We will unpack what God wants us to know about grace, how he wants us to respond to grace, how he wants us to further this message of grace so that we know how we should respond. So each, scene, each episode will start with a fellowship city nurtures and then it will be what we should be doing as God's people, as God's church. So to better understand how a fellowship city nurtures grace, we're gonna look at the big picture of the Bible. So we're gonna do an overview of the main story of the Bible. This will help us to better understand grace. Then we're gonna dig into what is grace and where do we find this in the Bible? Then we're gonna look at what it means for us. So individually, what does it mean for me? And what does it mean for the church? Even though we've titled our sermons as a Fellowship City Nurtures, in, in, today, in today's service, particularly grace, it doesn't mean this message is only for Fellowship City. The principles we find in the sermon around grace and what it means for the church and for us applies to everyone who is a believer and applies to any church and any context that they're in because it comes from God's word. God calls us to be in this way as we would look at each episode in our series. So let me pray for us as we get ready to hear from God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for an opportunity to gather to hear from you. We thank you for a time of praise and worship. 
singing songs of praise and worship to you, being reminded of grace, this amazing grace that you've lavished us. I pray that this morning as we open your word, that you would speak to us through your word, that you would engage us, that you would tug at our heartstrings. You would remind us what you would want us to know and how we ought to respond to your word. I pray against any distraction this morning. I pray that we may be focused on you and you alone. I pray that the words of my mouth may be a pleasing, pleasing sacrifice to you, Lord. Would your people hear you and not me? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So big picture. So we're going to look at first the big picture of the Bible, and that's through an overview of the Bible, so we can understand the main story of the Bible. And when we understand the whole Bible story, we will understand grace a little bit better. So I'm going to try and keep this part short, uh, because that can be a sermon on its own. Um, so I'm going to leave out some information. I'm going to highlight some of the most important truths, because this overview alone is a long one. So the Bible is made up of 66 books, starting from Genesis to Revelation. And the 66 books are split between the Old and the New Testament. The first five books, which are called the Pentateuch, it's, it's particularly a Greek word that's made of two words. So penta meaning five and tuch meaning box or container. So the first five books um, are, are, are named in this way. These books are namely Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They are classified as the Torah, even though at times we use the Torah as wisdom literature and not only these first five books. Then we have historical books. Um, we have wisdom texts. Um, we have uh, wisdom texts like Proverbs. Then we have the Minor and the Major Prophets. This is all in the Old Testament. Then the New Testament includes four Gospels, then Acts and Letters, which are for individuals or for churches. So those are the books and themes of the Bible. There's four words that best describe the basic story of the Bible. And the four words are creation, fall, redemption, and sanctification. So the four words are creation, fall, redemption, and sanctification. So creation is seen in Genesis. So God makes everything and he makes it all good. Then still in Genesis, we see the fall described. We understand it to be rebellion against God. We understand it to be wanting to be king over our own lives, drawing the moral lines ourselves. This rebellion has brought about death and destruction, which also brings about judgment, God's judgment. We see that judgment when God brings about the flood, but saves Noah and his family. However, evil still persists. And we see that again in the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel, which is rebellion against God. We see an introduction of Abraham, who ultimately has a covenant with God and has, has promised land, descendants, and blessing. We see the Israelites as a nation towards the end of Genesis. Then in Exodus, we see the birth of Moses, who then leads the Israelites. In Exodus, we see Moses at Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. He comes down and he already sees everyone breaking the commandments. We continue to see the Israelites and ultimately, including Moses, they don't see the promised land in the context of Exodus. We see some more moral laws in Leviticus, some popular ones like you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We see the Passover laws. We see priests um, in, in sacrifice rituals to atone for the sins of people. Deuteronomy acts like a review of what happened, even filling in some of the gaps in a 40-year period where the Israelites were wandering in the desert, in the wilderness. We see through the first books in the Bible and Exodus that God's chosen people fall and fall and fall again. They can't keep the law. They can't fix their relationship with God through their own merit. And it doesn't end there. We see judges or we have judges and Joshua. Joshua moves God's chosen people into the promised land. Judges show that there are cycles of moral corruption and wickedness that bring the people of God down again and again. That's what we see in Judges. 
the people are crushed by people around them, but God raises a judge and the people are spared and there is a new starting cycle. So this is a continuous cycle. During this time, there is no king in the context of judges and everyone did what they thought was right and there is a need for a king who is fair and just. And we see kings, priests and judgment in Samuel, in the books of Samuel and the books of Kings. Samuel was the last judge of Israel and also the first prophet after Moses. We then ultimately see David described as a man after God's own heart, um, who after some time becomes king over all 12 tribes. There is a rise of Jerusalem as a capital city, the tabernacle um, being the tent of the congregation of God where God dwells, um, moved into Jerusalem. Then we see a series of kings also succeed David. We see the prophets next who come as a mouthpiece, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and a few more, who come as a mouthpiece um, to God. Isaiah foretells that Jesus is going to come. He is a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting God, and Prince of Peace. So between the Old and New Testament, there's 400 years of silence and their different superpowers and empires during this time. And at the start of the New Testament, Jesus is born, and this is under the Roman Empire. He then lives, serves, dies, and rises again. He lives, serves, dies, and rises again. The church, in Acts we see Peter and, and, and Paul spread the gospel. The rest of the New Testament is exchanges between the New Testament writers and individuals or, or different churches. The letters are filled with theology and pastoral issues. We're seeing the ultimate hope of the church is a new heaven and earth, which we see in Revelations as well. So now that we understand the, the whole Bible overview, we understand the main story. Now that we understand that redemption is God making a solution for the problem, which is sin, which has come through the fall, Let's unpack grace a little bit more. So where do we find grace in the Bible? There are 131 uses of the word grace in the Bible. That's a lot. And there's 124 of the 131 uses are in the New Testament. 86 of these uses of the word grace come from the Apostle Paul. So we're going to be looking at one of his letters this morning to better understand what grace is through the letter to the Ephesians. The word grace can be described as undeserved favor. Let's use the Bible to break this down a little bit. In Ephesians 2, verses 7 to 10, uh, part of which Murindeng read for us, reads as follows. So that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So there are a lot of nuggets of gold in these verses. Still very important to understand the context of the verses, what precedes it, so as to best enjoy the words of the writer as they intended the audience to enjoy it. That is why we, we want to unpack context and understand context so that we understand the intention of the, the writer and how the audience should have enjoyed it. The letter to, to, to the Ephesians is written by Paul. Um, uh, the Ephesians are largely uh, Gentile believers. And in Ephesians 1, chapter 1, um, Paul tells the Ephesians about the blessing they have in Christ. Now, they've also been chosen and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Um, Paul also then prays for them, that they would fully understand the spiritual blessing they have in Christ. So that's part of what we see in chapter one. In chapter two, Paul starts by reminding the Ephesians of the condition that they have before Christ. 
outside of a relationship with Christ, that they are dead in their sins. So someone who's dead can't help themselves. So they can't fix their relationship with Christ. They are objects of wrath and destined to face the just judgment for their sins. So to fix the relationship with God, they would have to legalistically follow the old law, follow the Ten Commandments. But as we have seen in the Old Testament, this is not possible. No one could follow the law without failure. If we take a quick side road, um, the Ten Commandments mention laws that pertain to a relationship with God. Laws like no other gods before me. And we can't achieve these laws because we have many idols that wage war for our attention. Some like money, comfort, or our phones. Some of the commandments pertain to others like thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not commit adultery. But if you look at your brother with hate, then you have committed the sin. Or if you look at someone with lustful eyes, then you've committed adultery. So what should be clear to us is that we cannot save ourselves. Before Christ, before and outside of Christ, we are dead to our transgressions and sins. So let's double click verse seven of Ephesians two. So that in the coming ages, he might display the measurable riches of his grace through this kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God has given a measurable and incredible blessing to those who are in Christ. God here chooses to save sinners, not based on their goodness or their kindness or their charity or their humanitarian efforts, but because of his kindness alone. He does this to demonstrate his grace, undeserved favor. We have no claim over this grace, but he chooses to give it to us because of his kindness and the favor we have in him. In verses eight to nine reads, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. So verse seven starts with four. Because of what has come before, this statement is true. Because we were dead in our transgressions and couldn't do nothing to save ourselves, nothing to make ourselves alive, because of his great mercy, we are alive because of his immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. A small rabbit hole exists here. So the word this that we see at first glance may seem to refer to grace. So we see um, part A, part B of verse A says, um, this gift is not of or from yourselves. So this may seem to refer to grace, making a statement for you are saved by grace through faith and grace is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. And this meaning may be true in essence because grace isn't from us, but it is from God, but also, the word this can be seen at first glance to refer to faith, making the sentence for you are saved by grace through faith and faith is not from yourself, it is a gift of God. So even though faith or grace at first glance seem to be what is referred to by the word this, it is not what the intention of the author is. So this in the Greek technical language and grammar has a gender. Basically, a gender in the Greek grammar and technical language, which is basically to, to put an attribute to the noun, which is to best help to understand the text a little bit more. So this is neuter, which means neutral in the Greek technical language. And then we've got grace and faith, which we believe could be referred to by the word this. Both of these are feminine. This basically means that when we think of tense and the grammar around the Greek, that this does not actually refer to either grace or either faith. So the Greek grammar doesn't agree with either a direct reference to grace or faith, but it agrees rather with the whole sentence. So this means therefore salvation by grace through faith is not from ourselves. It is gift, 
it's God's gift. So therefore, salvation by grace through faith is not from ourselves, but it's God's gift. Faith here is God's creation and not our free will to believe in God for the gift. If faith was our choice, well, then Paul might have left this line out completely, and this is not from you, because it is clear grace isn't, and salvation, because we can't keep the law. Also, the noun attribute we see would agree with the statement, for you are saved by grace through faith, and faith is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, but the gender doesn't agree. So it simply means the grace is not from us. The saved or the salvation is not from us. And the faith is not from us. For us to believe is the gift of God and to be saved through faith is a gift of God. It is not either or, but rather both and. For us to believe is the gift of God and to be saved through faith is a gift of God. This is again why we need to read and reread and find the nuggets of gold that exist that we might have missed the first time to understand the intention of the, of the, of the author. Also, we see Paul said they were dead. Therefore, they can't have faith because if you're dead, you can't help yourself. It speaks again to this, not referring to faith or grace directly, but referring to the whole statement. And the reason why is so that we can't boast. We could not boast. We could boast if faith was from ourselves. If we build up our own faith, we could boast, but it is not. His grace finds us just as we are, empty handed, but alive because of him. We are changed by his love. We are made alive and created in Christ Jesus. It is a free gift of salvation by grace through faith so that God may be glorified. I just want to look at uh, uh, Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. So many people, when they read Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, they stop there, but, but we shouldn't stop there. We should continue reading to better understand the intention of Paul in verses eight to nine. So God made a plan. We understand that grace is undeserved favor. We understand that through Adam and Eve, we all sin and rebel against God. We want to be king over our own lives. But as we see in the Old Testament, we cannot help ourselves. We will continue to fall short of the glory of God. We'll continue to sin. We will continue to forget like the Israelites have forgotten. We will continue to place idols before God. We do this. We can't keep the Ten Commandments, nor can we fix our relationship with God. We can't fix it through our works. So God has made a redemptive plan, which is salvation by grace through faith, which is all a gift from him. So let's look at verses 10 as we continue reading. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. We are created in Christ Jesus because of the redemptive plan of God. We were dead before, but he made a plan. This is what Paul says when he starts in chapter 2. In verse 4 to 5, Paul says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, 
even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Paul says it. Paul is mentioning the same thing in different ways. So we, we were dead in our trespasses, but we are saved by grace. He made us alive in Christ. And that is why we say we are created in Christ. We are alive because of him. We are no longer dead because of him. And in response to being alive, we do good works. In response to being alive, we do good works. We are hidden or created in Christ Jesus who quenches the wrath of God. If we are not in Christ Jesus, we will face the wrath of God justly because of our sins and we will face eternity in hell instead of living with him. So what does workmanship mean here? We are created in Christ Jesus. We are a new creation. We are alive. It's a new way of acting, a new way of thinking, a new way of being, being more and more like Christ. The good works are an external proof of the workmanship. The good works are an external proof of the workmanship. Christ, we, we created in Christ Jesus. What does he prepare ahead of time for us? As we do good works, we are doing them because of Christ who enables us and therefore we make much of him. We were created to be in a relationship and make much of God. So think back to creation. He made everything and it was good. So we have come to understand our purpose and why we were created. We also now understand grace a little bit better. We also have come to understand that God reconciles us to himself through grace. Now, what does this mean for us? What does it mean for Fellowship City? A Fellowship City nurtures grace by knowing what grace is. A Fellowship City nurtures grace by knowing why we have grace and how we respond to this wonderful gift of grace. We believe that God has sent us to reach the city of Centurion and to make an impact in the city. You may not be part of Fellowship City, but I think this is true of you also. Grace is there for you and the response to grace is applicable to you because of what God has done, not to achieve our own salvation. Response to grace is applicable to you or the church and context that you would be in, that God has placed you in. It means we have to follow the example of Paul. Paul in Ephesians 4, verse 1 to 3 says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to work worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. These are the characteristics that our maker, our God and Father says we should have if we believe. Same as we see the manufacturer of BMW encourages certain characteristics of the drivers like we heard in the beginning. God says as a fellowship city that nurtures grace is one that has its people united in making much of God because that's our purpose. This means finding opportunities to bring the grace of God and word of God to those around us. Finding opportunities to bring the grace of God and word of God to those around us. Not living in disunity, but being united in spirit through the bond of peace. It means being ready to witness and share the reason for our faith. It means being willing to have hard conversations, even around race, because we believe that we are transcultural. Meaning we understand the beauty of the different backgrounds that exist within our context and we transcend this then only do we make one new community in Christ. And where, even if we were to fall, we would find grace. We should be doing life on life, life in community and life on mission together. I know that this is hectic and, and there are always 101 things that we need to still do, but I love a saying that AJ Gatley 
often says. It's not that we are busy, but is that we are unwise with our time. If we're to do this, if we're to keep modeling Christ to one another, we are able to teach and admonish one another and present one another perfect in Christ. Where we fall short, we find grace. Means giving sacrificially your time, talents, and treasure. Looking out for the orphans and widows. Again, doing so in such a way that people are asking why and who are these people? What is different about them? And that brings us a gospel opportunity. In view of his great mercy and in light of all he's done, we should give our lives as a living sacrifice to him. In view of his great mercy and in light of all he's done, we should give our lives as a living sacrifice to him. What does it mean for the church? In Fellowship City that nurtures grace is one that has its people living worthy of the call they've received. So much so that the city or the area in which they're in have people wondering and asking why are they different? They love one another deeply across racial, economic, and social boundaries. They love one another deeply. When people come into the midst, when people come into in between them, they feel this love. They feel God among them. And we should be missional. Should be missional in finding gaps within the community to show grace and to show God, to point back to God. In a moment, I'm going to share the details of a, of a study conducted by the Center of Bible Engagement. The reason I'm sharing um, the study and its findings is because these findings show where we should have the greatest effort in response to grace and the sermon. Many of you may have heard the study or may know the study. Um, the study included um, 400,000 individuals that were, that, that were put through this, this um, study or this, this case study. Um, they wanted to understand, or the center of, of, of uh, Bible engagement wanted to understand how people engage with their Bibles, how people engage with God's word. They found some very interesting information as a byproduct of what they were actually looking for. So they found something different to what they were looking for in terms of outcome. So they found that reading or engaging with scripture one time a week had negligible, negligible effect on key areas of people's lives. So it didn't have the same type of effect that people would think it would have. So that means tuning once a Sunday to listen to Rain or saying, open your Bibles or reading the Bible once a week. It had negligible effect on people's key areas of their lives. And they saw that three times a week had some effect. So there was some effect. So reading your word three times a week started to build up something. Something was starting to happen. But they realized that reading four or more times a week showed some real lasting life change. That people started to feel lonely or people within that, that context or that, that case study, that, that, that there was a 30% drop in loneliness. That anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in the relationships that those individuals had dropped 40%, alcoholism dropped 57%, and feeling spiritually stagnant dropped 60%, where sometimes some people will feel spiritually stagnant. And, and the question would be, how, how often are you reading your Bible? So think about some of the things that we should not be feeling. So those are some of the things we shouldn't be showing to the world. But think about the, the, the characteristics or the positive characteristics we should have. So they saw that sharing your faith jumped 200% if you did it four times a week, if you read your Bible four more times a week. And this is largely due to the confidence we have in God's word. Discipling others jumped 230% when we read our Bibles. Not glossing over them, but digging into them, finding the nuggets of gold, saturating ourselves in God's word. And then letting God's word change us from the inside out, conform us to be more like Christ. We are then able to love one another better, understand grace better, become humble, gentle, patient, and bear with one another in love, keeping united in the spirit. And I understand this, this is hard. But if you aren't reading your Bible regularly, I would ask if you have asked others around you to hold you accountable or even read alongside you. And where we fall short, there is grace. There is grace where we fall short. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for 
your word, we thank you that you have made a plan, a redemptive plan through Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. Through his death, we are made alive when we were dead because of sin. We are made alive through his death on the cross. That it's not anything that we can do because we've seen that we can't do anything to, to fix our relationship with you. But it is only through your kindness that we have a relationship with you. We pray that you would continue to speak to our hearts and challenge us where we need to change, where we need to be more and more like Christ so that we are able to show this grace and show you to the context and to the world or the place that you have placed us. We pray that you would continually put us in spaces where we can grow, spaces where we can be accountable to one another, spaces where we can collectively make disciples who are making disciples where you've placed us. We pray that you would continue to challenge us to read our word, to hear from you through our Bibles, to build relationships where we can teach and admonish one another so we can present one another holy, perfect, and blameless before you. We thank you that you would not leave us, that you are there with us, even by spirit, that you would enable us, that you grant us the ability to build up our faith in you that comes from you, that you do the work first, that you bring us into a relationship with you, a relationship with others. So I pray that you would enable us to look outward and not only inward, to reach those around us in the city at large, to show the city grace, or to show whatever context you've placed us, your grace, your truth, and to show the city or the context you've placed us, Jesus Christ. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, and so uh, as we sing, uh, we're going to sing in response um, that in this, in light of the grace and mercy and peace that we receive from Christ, um, our response is to give everything. Um, not because we can bring our works, not because we can do anything, but because Christ did it all. And so we can come freely and give all that we are because Christ enables us uh, to do the good works that he's prepared for us. And so there's so much freedom in that, there's so much peace in that. And so we're going to sing that as a response. And so again, you may stand or sit, um, but uh, engage with the Father and give everything to him. In view of your great mercy, in light of all you've done, I present my life as a living sacrifice. In view of your great mercy, in light of all you've done, I will love you, God, with all my strength and heart. Lord, this is my worship. In Gilea, in Gilea. Oh 
Lord, everything, everything is yours. All that we are is yours. Our lives are yours. Our hearts are yours. Our hands, our deeds, our works are yours. And so may we be a community that makes much of Christ and not ourselves. May we fix our eyes on you. Give you all the glory and honor and praise. We thank you for your grace and your mercies towards us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Majesty, majesty, your grace has found me just as I am, empty-handed but alive in your hands. We are so undeserving of the sacrifice your son Jesus Christ made for us. Our sinfulness and brokenness deserve death. We cannot bear to be in the presence of your holiness, yet because of Christ, we have been made holy, worthy, and whole. Not only were our sins canceled through the death and resurrection of your son, but we have been made co-heirs with Christ. We get to spend our eternity with you. Lord John Newton put it so beautifully in his hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Thank you for this gift, Lord. You have found us where we are and you have loved us in spite of ourselves. Lord, may we show grace as you have shown us grace. I pray that as individuals, we would grapple with the grace that you have shown us so that we might understand the impact that it should have on our hearts and actions. May we long to show grace to the people around us just as you long to show us grace. I pray that you would soften our hearts in situations where you ask us to show supernatural grace. May you equip us, may you give us the tools we need. May you remind us how undeserving we are of your grace so that we do not stand in self-righteousness or judgment of others. May we remember that without the supernatural intercession of the Holy Spirit, we are weak, but with his intercession, we are able to do what may feel impossible. Lord, I pray that Fellowship City would be a church that is rooted in the power of the Spirit and that we would have such a deep understanding of the undeserving grace that we have received that we would not help, not be able to help, but show unmeasurable love and grace in our community. May we be a church that is deeply united in the Holy Spirit. Help us to be good witnesses on this side of heaven so that we bring glory and honor to your name. I pray this in your wonderful and precious name. Amen. All right, so let us end off with a good word, a benediction. And this is taken from Hebrews 13, 20, 21. Now, may the God of peace who brought up from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, so go in love, go in peace, go in grace, and stay safe.